Hey gang, welcome to Big Brother and the Hodling Company, a podcast about music and Web3 and trying to fend off Big Brother. I'm a Keegan Voice. Today I spoke with Simon de la Riviere, a builder, musician, and creator of all sorts. Simon co-designed the ERC20 Ethereum standard. He invented bonding curves and is now working to produce new science fiction using some Web3 mechanics through his business, Untitled Frontier. In the past, he also spent some time in the music industry, pioneering the first smart contract royalty payments with Imogen Heap at Ujo Music. And he introduced one of the first music non-fungible token or NFT collectibles in 2017 with the artist RAC. And all of these threads wound their way into our time together. So I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Here we go. Hey, Simon, it's great to have you here. Awesome, great to be here, I'm excited. To kick off these things, I always like to start at the beginning. And I would love to hear like when your relationship with music started and then work our way forward from there. I grew up in, in a musical family. My, my father used to play guitar. My mother, she was in, in musical, she was in musical theater and did ballet and dancing. So it's like quite a musical family. My sister played piano. My older brother also was in a band, played guitar. So there was always music around. And from a young age, my parents encouraged us to get involved with music from get, getting lessons to play the recorder to piano lessons to get, eventually guitar. And eventually just being a, like a teenager. And this is like the start of the 2000s and suddenly getting access to internet. And then suddenly also, mm-hmm. you know, now paying for the software but back then as a teenager Mm -hmm. (laughs) pirating some of the production studio equipment to play around with and learning the tutorials and so on and just making beats and like figuring things out and from there it was just like a passion it's like i i also grew up in a family where my parents were like like if there's one thing they want to do for their kids not it's not to just not discourage them from listening to whatever they want to listen to (laughs) yeah free reign and so coming up into this era where music was more readily available you could make music we can even share it and stuff like that i just started getting into music and music making and it was a form of expression i've always been a creative person and ex- have explored like different avenues of cre- creating things and music was one of the big early passions for me it was just like learning music going to live gigs absorbing it playing mm-hmm. music hearing music being played at home both by my family and also just over the stereo and whatnot. Yeah, and that's where it all started. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I'm curious. I think that's a beautiful sentiment that, you know, you were in a music family that that encouraged you to explore listening to whatever types of music that you wanted, explore instruments, you know, all of those things. I'm curious what your parents were listening to and what you were first exposed to. And then when you first started to diverge from that that musical home that they created for you, and then what that looked like. uh, that's that that's interesting. My parents, would they used to play when we had like barbecues or whatever. Obviously, back then, also being in South Africa, you didn't necessarily have access to a big, wide distribution of music, so you had access to like the popular-ish music of the day. And mm-hmm. my parents played like the Beatles, and I particularly remember like my 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 dad was really into Leonard Cohen, so we would listen mm-hmm. to Leonard Cohen. What else? Stuff I remember hits from the nineties, like Mike and the Mechanics. Also, my because we my mom used to take us to musicals and stuff. We also listened to soundtracks, so like Tarzan, Toy Story, mm-hmm. but that's kind of stuff she enjoyed with the kids. Lion King soundtrack. So that's the kind of stuff that would play in in the background. So it's, it, it was like also in the animals, Eyes of the Rising Sun, that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. And yeah, so my, my dad grew up playing guitar and like learning guitar. And so like we, we, he would also play some songs, Peter Sarsted, a bunch of those kind of stuff. And, and what was the second part of the question? Like when you first started to diverge or have an interest in going outside yes, right. of that. Yeah. I think a part of it also came from my older brother. And my older sister, because they had their own music taste, they were independent of. They were had like more, obviously more pop music taste. That wasn't music that my parents were listening to. My sister would come and go, "This is great new song. It's from Wakefield," <laughs> and I would be like, "This is a great pop track." Uh, <laughs> and my older brother was like, "This was '90s, right?" So grunge was in. Mm-hmm. Corn just came out with their hits like mm-hmm. metal and nice. grunge, and mm-hmm. God, this hits. This is mm-hmm. ooh, this is it's good music. And so that's as teenagers starting to diverge, and obviously. 
the stuff that was then popular for our generation like then is then stuff like Linkin Park came out, a new metal, and like this was like new and different music, like rock music. You know, I started listening to Linkin Park, Breaking Benjamin. I think the, mm -hmm. one of the big bands at that era that like really made me delve. I first for me represents like becoming a super fan and like, obsessed with this band, going into online forums, like reading and talking to other fans was Muse, mm -hmm. and just being obsessed with this band. They, they had such a fresh sound, and they it was just a mixture of harmonics and stuff that just really made me love and fall in love with music and yeah that's where it diverged started more into rock music and then eventually creating more into electronic music once the sort of edm era came around and then just from there going to that rabbit hole further deeper into like electronic music just discovering stuff like fx twin and boards of canada nice. ambient music so yeah, and then obviously then once you actually, because the thing about what's exciting with electronic music was also that you could, if you had the production studios, it was easier to recreate that sound than having mm -hmm. access to a recording studio to recreate the right. rock sound. So you felt like you could, especially if, oh, all the music that's being made in America and Europe and the UK, but you're from South Africa, so, oh, I can actually make something that sounds as good, but I don't necessarily have to have access to a studio or a recording studio to create that sound. Cool. No, totally. That that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that new metal was was one of your routes away. That was also one of mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. New metal is actually having a resurgence right now. There's like a renaissance right? thing that's happening, which I, yeah. I appreciate. I can't help. I can't help but appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> All the millennials are going nice this is great. yeah let's get our old corn <laughs> records and slipknot out and yeah. bang a little yeah. bit again or like one of the bands that's also has a big resurgence is like deftones right and yeah. and it's all from tiktok right because it's like they they have this specific tone to their music that's really great mm. for short snippets right mm. and that's why it's, mm. oh, it's become popular on tiktok because it's this it's deftones is an aesthetic sound right yeah. <laughs> so stuff like that getting popular again yeah, yeah, it's refreshing because so many creators are intentionally creating sounds to be short form snippet content for TikTok. It's nice to see something mm. that wasn't created for that actually being utilized yeah. for this purpose. Yeah, so I want to take a step back to something that you said, kind of the first band that you really became attached to in a different way at a different level was Muse. And I'm curious, like around when that was relative to the technology that was available to you and how you pursued you know, deepening your relationship with the band and other people who were fans of the band at that time. This was when I was like 14, 15, one of my friends had, they had, because obviously the only access to music really at that point for me was, this was like in the early 2000s as a teenager, and we only had access to dial-up. I only got access mm -hmm. to like broadband when I was 18 or 19. And so dial-up was the only thing. So the only place you could get your music from was like what is popular in the charts, go to the music stores, go look what's there. And then MTV and stuff was still around and like mm -hmm. local music channels. So that's where you got your stuff. And But so if, but if one of your friends brought some music, they're like, dude, listen to this stuff. It's really cool. That's how you got into that stuff. So one few friends started listening to music and I was like, this is awesome. Or they would have this a mixture of like a bunch of songs and one of them was like Muse and I was like, this is great. I want to listen to more of this band. So where can I get it? So you get got it from friends and whatever, trying to find it. And then once you got became more of a passionate fan, you would actually go try and save some money to go actually go buy the actual CDs in the stores. And so I bought all the CDs, I bought all the live DVDs, like just to watch the stuff. Because obviously again, I can't watch the stuff on dial up modems, like it's impossible. Right. So you had to go get the, the live DVDs to go watch the live shows and stuff like that until Broadbank came around. So yeah, that, that's how like the sort of relationship deepened and the rest the, with the technology. Also, once like you could get access to more forums and the internet started getting cheaper and the, maybe slightly bit faster and so on, that's when I started going to like the online forums and reading what people are saying, getting excited. Because once a new album comes out, there's all these teasers and then maybe like they're playing snippets of new songs live and you would participate with mm -hmm. all the fans and stuff. So right. that, that was really exciting just to feel like, oh, damn, like, this is cool. You can actually be a part of this community and participate mm -hmm. through this format and also just finding fans on social media and so on. This was like, this was 
the great era of web two is just actually yeah. being able to find the people that like the stuff you do. Yeah. So that was cool. Even if you're just a kid from South Africa. Next. <laughs> totally. The more organic days of web two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was doing a little, I was doing a little bit of LinkedIn stalking on your profile <laughs> and I came across <laughs> what I think was the first thing that, that you entered in your, in your work experience was this thing called tweakly.fm. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was really intrigued because it was like some, it was like an integration with last FM where you yeah. can actually take some of the statistics and the metrics and expose them to social platforms. And I, it's, it sounds really, it was like in 2010 or something, I think. And it sounds really ahead of its time. This like intersection of music and social is still something people are trying to figure out. I'm curious. I'm curious to hear just about that project in general, yeah. what, what happened to it. Uh, that, I think that was the start of everything for me. Um, I think <laughs> during the, during, cause that was 2009. So that was when I started university and mm. there were these summers where like nothing was happening and you were just stuck at home. And I used that time to, to learn coding and just make fun apps and stuff. And obviously that era as well was like the start of the, the platform of platform era of web two, where we're making, opening up the platforms to applications. They call them like mashups. So you would like mash up two apps together to mm. combine the data. And it was like this promise of this public web that you can just take data and mix and match them and so on. And mm. so I was playing around and it was like, I really love, I still use last of him to do this day. I, I really love last of him then and I love it now. And so with last of him, it was like, you, you record your music, the, what you're listening to independent of your specific platform that you're using. And I was starting to use Twitter and it was like, oh, Twitter just released like the ability to build apps for it. And I was like trying to think of things, something that would be fun. And I was like, I share my music a lot on Twitter. So I was like, let me just make this automatic as like a first app, like the app that combined Last of M with Twitter. And every week it would take your top three listened artists and just automatically post an update to, to Twitter. And yeah, I called it uh, Twiggly FM, twitterweekly.fm. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it was really interesting era because back then, Wolf didn't even exist yet. I think it was started by Twitter, right? I literally had to store, people were giving me their passwords Wow. And I was store. I had to store them plain text. That was the only way this stuff worked back then. I was like, it's so absurd to think now in this era of the web where you go like someone was giving you your passwords. Like just, <laughs> yeah. I trust you. Here's my passwords. Yeah. And in plain text, right? Mm, yeah. That was a really interesting because I was just like a newbie coder, like trying to figure out how to make the, do stuff with the web. And I built it and I said, here's this thing, try it out. And because it had this built-in viral loop where every week there was like more stuff being shared and then new people signed up and every week more stuff was shared and more people signed up. And then it was this viral loop that was just like, once it started, it just kept running. And I actually ran into a lot of problems as a result because it grew virally from there. Every, it was just like one PHP file that was like running the script every week. And I, it was all on shared hosting. So my shared hosting provider got pissed off at me. They're like, you're like, what are you doing? Like you're ruining this, the hosting service. <laughs> and then I was like, I don't have any money. I'm a student. I right? like, what do I do now? And so I tried to move the service to its, to a dedicated hosting provider, but I had to raise money. So people donated to the thing, but then I completely failed because that also didn't work out. And it was just like this mess. I was just like, this thing was growing much faster than I thought it would. I think at its peak, it was, it was like hundreds of thousands of users sending like millions oh. of updates over oh. the course of a year. Like this was becoming very popular. And then there was a guy that, that, that started seeing this and he goes, yeah, I'm also going to build this. And I was like, can you, I, why don't we just work together? I don't know how to do any of this stuff. Like I'm still <laughs> learning. Please just help me. We can share ownership over this thing. And so for quite a few years, there was a guy, Scott Wilcox. He ran the project basically. He built it, added like different social media, Facebook, Tumblr, or the, all the rest. There was also a period where I think Last FM wanted to buy it, Weekly FM, and we actually had discussions oh, with wow. them about it, but it didn't work out. I think I, I was just so new to everything. I had no idea how to negotiate or do the stuff at all. So I was like, pointless. Let me just not continue with down this rabbit hole. Um, mm. But so the platform survived for quite long. And then I think a year or two ago, they, Scott, I, I, I just said, you know what, 
this I started this, but I haven't been running this for nine years. I thought Scott did it's your baby, man. I can't claim ownership of this anymore. And so then he eventually sold it to another guy that took it over. But then literally this year, due to Twitter's API changes, they right. shut the project down. And right. it was a really interesting experience because it, it progress of the entire application. This was like the four hundred and seventieth Twitter application ever. This was one of the first Twitter applications ever. And it it actually its lifespan was like a summary of how the web changed. Web two point mm-hmm. comes out super exciting, like OAuth doesn't even exist yet. People are happy to even give you your passwords. That's how little they care about how important Web two point is to like Twitter changing its API, to like yeah. becoming a more popular project. And then eventually ending up into like death because now all the platforms are changing. Reddit is changing. Twitter is changing. All the platforms are closing up their API. They're charging right. way more. The walled gardens are going up. Yeah. The, that era of the web is gone. It's changing. And that's what got me into crypto is like that change. But yeah, so that's the history of Tweetly of M. It was a really <laughs> fun, exciting pro- project. And like you said, I think there's still value there in, in having a platform that's more social. I, I always mm-hmm. look at, I use Spotify and I always like lament mm-hmm. the fact that there's poor social context in Spotify. Like the first streaming service I used was RDO. What I enjoyed about RDO was there was that comments. You can, could go read what people are saying. And it was great to go. Now to get that context, you have to go to YouTube. That's where people are commenting really, or wherever else people are. But that's like the main venue, like, or maybe TikTok to a lesser extent, but YouTube is like, oh, if you want to hear what people are feeling about a song, you go to YouTube comments. That's how I'm rambling more about it. <laughs> no, that was great. Yeah, I agree with you. It's like, a, you know, this topic is at the center of a lot of the work that, that I do in this frustration around not having a more social space for something that is music focused and just seeing all of the context and the emotional experience people have around music abstracted away from the music itself and that's Mm. you know that's really detrimental and then and coupled with that is you know, to your point, like the API changes that a lot of these huge platforms that are centralized are are starting to do is in all these walled gardens is a perfect segue to the importance of open source technology and decentralization. And would love to hear a little bit about how you made that transition in your head, because you did it, I think, a lot earlier than a lot of other people. And talk a little bit about, about kind of the beginnings of Ujo music and how that came to be mm. as well. I think the underlying thing for me is like, I, being a creator, I suffer the problems of the creator. So there's sometimes a lot of stuff I think about is if these are problems I am having, like what is the broader issue going on here? And like, how can I help solve some of those problems? And a big thing being in South Africa was stuff I also did as a teenager was I made games and mm-hmm. just having access to dial-up modem and zero access to any of the financial technology that was being built at that time, like PayPal or other stuff. I couldn't sell any of my games digitally as a self, as a, like self publishing. You, mm-hmm. the only way was to enter into publishing agreements or whatever. And that was a big frustration. Like I, I could see people were making indie games and selling them. And I was just like, I don't know how to do this. I can't figure it out. And that was a big frustration. It's coupled with eventually discovering Bitcoin and seeing the potential for cross border payments and easier right. payment technology. And then also eventually seeing how APIs were starting to change around 2012 and being frustrated by it, especially Twitter, I also wanted to work with a technology that had the promise that if I'm going to invest time and effort into this, that there's at least more of a belief that this stuff will stick around. So that's what I saw in blockchain technology. It's both as a payment system to support creators, but also as a platform where Whatever we build with this, we have more reasonable trust that this will stay around. The APIs will continue to exist. And because I was so passionate about music with Twigly FM, I was still making a lot of music back in 2013, 2014, and so on. The first sort of project I built in the crypto space was with my brothers. We made like a service where it was like a simple idea, just pay Bitcoin, get a digital file. That's Mm. as simple as possible. 
obviously the market wasn't there at all and we had to run all our own infrastructure we had to run all our own bitcoin nodes and whatever so it was difficult to spin this up but that was like towards that goal right and experiencing the difficulty in like the platform itself like working with bitcoin trying to make it do what you want to do it's like then in in 2014 when i really got into this technology and like the promise of it when i discovered ethereum and realized this is both an ideologically more friendly towards developers but also practically friendly towards developers so it both the things that when they say come build stuff and this is the perfect timing for me i was like this was exactly what i wanted from a technology and so i dove in head first and because i was so excited about digital media creators music that's when i started experimenting first with musicians and because mm -hmm. being a musician i knew the problems of the musician back then it was just like put your songs in soundcloud and hope you go viral and <laughs> participate in that way but like even like participating in in like digital media sales was still also difficult right because there were you could the itunes and stuff like that was available to yes um, americans but not really as easily for south africans so that 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 was still part of the desire to work on this technology and so that transition really started from there to so going, okay, it was both a desire to use the technology for creators, both still being interested in music and then starting one of some of the first experiments with teams out of consensus. I, at the end of 2014, I joined, at the beginning of 2015, I joined consensus, one of the first employees. And part of the first work I was doing was both helping lay the groundwork for the infrastructure. So I was working on like token standards, stuff like that, but then also working on the music side, actually making products people want to use. So in 2015, just after Ethereum launched, we did like the first, I think it's probably one of the first like actual used smart contracts, not just playful, whatever. We did like the experiment with Image and Heap where it was just a demonstration of using smart contracts for royalty payments. But essentially, here's a system to demonstrate an automated split that once you buy the music, it automatically split to different contributors and it was transparent and public. You could see how the money went to different parts of the whoever made up this track and made it. So that's why the transition happened and then it's how we just started was with that simple experiment. Let's actually demonstrate the technology and show how this can be useful for musicians. Cool. In my mind, still one of the most exciting use cases, you know, about this technology is like the automated splits that if not for the legacy system <laughs> and the issues with metadata that exist today it could be, would feel like a very natural transition yeah let's just do that but it's obviously more complicated than that yeah the rabbit holes deep <laughs> yeah one of the things that i always hear about ujo music is oh it's this really cool thing that was just ahead of its time right? and that's the, that's like often time the way that i hear it framed and i'm curious to hear your perspective as someone who was part of the project so intimately and watched it grow and ultimately decline and just get your thoughts on if is that the case was it too early yes i think that's a big contributing factor but i think part of that is that when you do something that's really early part of your job is to educate people through your product or through other means to explain why this is beneficial and because you're also building on a technology that is self growing, like Ethereum in itself back then, is that there weren't a lot of standards or contract coding, like wallets, MetaMask. I think Ujo was one of the first applications that had like a built in browser wallet, right? Mm. So this was like new thing. Like we didn't know how to give people access to the stuff where you're supposed to run your own node. Part of the problem of being early is like you, you have to figure out how to essentially prioritize and that's really difficult like you don't know what is the most important thing to focus on because on one side you're like let me focus on the product but if you're not building the proper infrastructure people are going to arrive at your door and they go like i have no idea how to open this door what is going on here why is there this engine in front that i have to kickstart and then dump some fuel in it's wet and buy to crypto somewhere but where am i buying crypto what's this yeah. what's this stuff so it's like a browser wallet, but what if the browser wallet is insecure? So there's, it's just like a lot of this difficulty in prioritizing because like one of the big rifts we often faced was, are we building infrastructure for people to build on top of the system or are we building product infrastructure? And that's the difficult thing that we have to like, had to try to figure out 
infrastructure related things like like you said like metadata right that's always a persistent problem in the music industry is like what were we building something that other applications were going to use to solve their metadata problems or were we building a product that we wanted to give to new creators to earn money from their music their connection to their fans and whatever so there's that's that was the difficulty really is figuring out how to prioritize and some days we were going in one direction then the other direction and then not really going anywhere at all mm-hmm. like spending months trying to incorporate some new infrastructure and then suddenly no one is building with that stuff anymore so now it's did we just waste three months of development time here so that that was just like really difficult and for that matter that's why when i started i thought of frontier i was like i'm gonna do as little infrastructure development as possible just focusing on products as much as i get mm-hmm. that that was like the difficult part really yeah, makes sense. It feels like you did a lot of the necessary trial and error to create precedence, or at least the beginning of, of some standards so that other people wouldn't have to do that in the future, which is yeah. super important work. We learned a lot and a, and a lot of people looked at the failures that we experienced and learned from it. That, that's always the gamble you take. But right. for me, that's, what, that's the joy I get from playing with new things. It's like your failure is a lesson for others. And I think that's still super meaningful. Absolutely. So if you were in reflecting, what was the, if you could distill, distill the failure that is most important, most salient, what would it be? The thing that you think other people who are building an on-chain music today should still be paying attention to? If there's, if there's one thing, if I would go back and redo this, it could, might be like a bit more like cheesy, direct, like startup-ish advice, which is like, it is a cliche, but get product market fit, right? If there's people that use your product, talk to them and understand why they're there and like iterate from there. I think the fact that we focused a lot on infrastructure was smart because that's what Ethereum was. Like it was infrastructure development. And for the most of Ethereum's life, like even now, still a lot of de- development effort is spent on infrastructure development, like layer twos and what, whatnot, right? Or zero knowledge proofs and these things. And so the real core advice is just get as quickly as possible to making something that people want to use and then iterating from there. And I think it is obviously more difficult in the blockchain space because part of what you're building is something that you want other people to also use. And that's where the big dilemma comes in. It's really difficult, but it's much e- Let me put it this way. It's much easier to go from a successful product to building infrastructure to going from infrastructure and then building successful users of the infrastructure and having successful product users. And so... Yes, even if you go, oh no, like we have to like port all the data to new systems or oh, we're like used hard-coded smart contracts that is not going to be used anymore. You still have something that's solvable problems some, somehow. Even if it's, oh, it's going to cost us $500,000 to move all the data from the smart contracts or whatever. If you have a company with users, you can get that money. You know? <laughs> so yeah. that, that really is like the key thing, I think. It's just as fast as possible get there. And we often get really easily inside of our heads when we do this stuff and sometimes it's just because we're really passionate but i was passionate about ethereum and blockchain infrastructure i was still passionate of, i was still doing like smart contract auditing for fun mm-hmm. during that time like uh, doing the music product stuff so it's really about focus and just going this is the one thing that needs to work to get mm-hmm. there as soon as possible and if it's not working move on keep iterating but that's, that's cliche startup advice, but it's the reason it's cliche. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a truth to every cliche that really resonates. I've been thinking a lot about even still like the, this sort of chicken and egg problem between infrastructure and application and the fallacy of, of if you build it, they will come. <laughs> and yeah, that still resonates. And I think that's still such a hard it's still such a hard lesson for people to understand because like you said, like, it's really interesting. It's you're in this thing all the time, all day. You understand the problem way better than everybody else. You understand the product that you want to build way better than everybody else, but being willing to be flexible in what that product looks like, how it turns out and letting other people dictate the behavior of that evolution is hard. You have to give up some of the control when you're so concentrated in it your belief 
Yeah, absolutely. There's something else I also remember now that was quite difficult. And and I think still today it's like outstanding or it's like it's still something that, that product designers in this space still think about, which is what we struggle with sometimes is like how much do we hide of this blockchain system? How much do we abstract away? Because there was a, early on, it was like a lot of stuff like people not going to use wallets. They would want to use credit cards, like all this kind of talk about abstracting away all the stuff and hiding everything in the background. And it was this cliche of, yeah, you use a website. No one knows you're using a server kind of talk and whatever. But on the other side, it was like, yes, that's true. But I think part of the value of the system, using the system comes from the fact that you realize why this, this sort of infrastructure is different to just a database stored somewhere in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. There is a reason why. And so there was this difficult trade-off between going, should we show like the guts of this engine to the user? And nowadays we know, yeah, people are actually okay to do certain stuff that in the past we were thought they wouldn't do, right? Mm-hmm. While it's like looking at block explorers, that kind of stuff. And maybe that's still the early cohort of users. Maybe it still will be abstracted more and more away into the future. But that was the difficulty in like the design trade-offs. And to me, it's like the one thing I always thought about that product design problem is that people do care about the engines and the guts of, of something, but they use that as a way to to justify their decisions, right? Mm-hmm. So if you go, I'm going to buy a new car, right? 10% of people who buy a car like really care about what engine is in there and like this kind of thing and that kind of thing. But for most people, they're going, I'm buying the car. Now I need to make a decision. And that's when it's, if you talk about the engine, it's a way to justify to yourself, okay, this engine is better than that engine, even though I've actually no clue how an engine works at all, but this sounds nicer. Or like, how do I choose between this iPhone and this Android or whatever? It's like, oh, but that thing is more megapixels or like better lens or whatever. Even though the day to day, you can't actually justify. If someone goes and tells you right now, like, why is this actually better? You might not be even to be able to explain it. And so in that sense, it's like, Showing the guts of the system is a way to make people feel and realize, oh, there's this something else happening here, even though I can't necessarily describe or fully understand it. But subject subject to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting balance to try to achieve because to your point, Web3, saying the blockchain, these things that have become buzzwords at this point, but... Uh, yeah, where it's like Web3. It's like, what is that? What, what is that? Yeah. It's like when something can mean anything, it doesn't mean anything at all. Mm. It's when indie used to mean something in music kind of idea. For people to understand, there is like an ethos attached to it that can make your product differentiated from a lot of the other things that are happening. We're doing the exact same thing on the surface, but our data is not being stored in a database in a centralized server somewhere in Silicon Valley. It's distributed across the like, over the Ethereum blockchain. There is something too that, to your point of, if you elevate that enough so that people understand the value and benefit that they're getting from this new technology without making it like so rigid that it feels, that it feels off-putting and that it feels like there's a wall in front of you. I have no idea like what an NFT is. I don't care enough about it to go use your, your product. I don't know. It's an interesting juxtaposition and like an interesting marketing question to think about, like, how do we actually talk about ourselves when we're building on this thing? Even like the word NFT, right? I remember when we started out, I think you know, Uche launched also one of the first music NFTs, right? So mm-hmm. it was 20, 2017, but we just called it a badge, right? Or digital mm-hmm. collectible badge. And it wasn't even the NFT standard. It was just like the old ERC20 token, fungible token standard, but we had a picture for it. And like we even got ether scan to add the picture and like even a metamask if you add the token you could see the picture it was supposed to represent the same thing you would get from buying a cd you would get this representation of the thing that that you bought and back then it was just like no one called this stuff nfts they were just called collect uh, collectibles or no one tried to popularize nfts because again that was like this feeling of no one's going to call this nfts because what are you saying a non-fungible token it's yeah. like an anti word yeah. relating to something everything is non-fungible it's yeah, yeah. fungible things that are the weird stuff yeah, right yeah, true. <laughs> right yeah. and so it's like what is going on here and um and then if you get to see some of the Ujo blog posts where we're talking about when we launched some of the badges stuff we we say digital collectibles because we were like this is how people are going to understand it but then nfts 
started becoming more popular and then everyone started collecting NFTs. And that was like a really interesting lesson in like how you describe things because digital collectible does not entirely encompass why this is a new thing. Farmville has digital collectibles. Nine has digital collectibles. Why is this new? And having an entirely new name to that encapsulates all the new context is the one that got successful. And it reminded me of the era of the MP3 mm-hmm. because people started calling songs MP3s because the format allowed, the, it was so different from what it was before that you right. now could share it with people on an easy basis. That became the name for the music, what MP3s do you have? And then eventually once the streaming era came around, no one calls the stuff MP3s and when I was just songs. So who knows, maybe in the future, we come to expect that digital collectibles can have multiple containers from blockchain containers to like Apple containers to Valve con- containers or Epic Games containers, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I was also an interesting lesson in, in going, yeah, you can try as much as you can to make this as easy as possible for people. But then this random technical term becomes a thing that people adopt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's strange. And then after that, like after NFTs like blew up, um, of course, there was a lot of pushback to it eventually because it, it was associated with some of the worst behavior that happens within the crypto space, like a lot of speculation, a lot of over financialization of like that specific aspect yeah. of the token. And there have been a lot of organizations that have now reverted away from using NFT yeah. to saying, you know, on-chain token or digital collectible even yeah like i've seen digital yeah. collectible again and at that point it no longer is differentiated from any other type of digital collectible mm-hmm. but there's some that still use on-chain in some capacity but it's an interesting sort of evolution or de-evolution of this terminology that we're still trying to figure out h- how to talk about with people yeah. <laughs> but there are since we're talking about music it's like music genres as well there's always yeah. discussion about what is a music what is actually in this music genre or like yeah. when music genres get sub genres, but the sub genres subsume the name of the primary genre. And then everyone's mad at each other because that's not <laughs> that genre. This is yeah. actually this genre. Same thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's, I guess, a lesson in like classification and you can just get more and more granular and yeah. sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it isn't. And I guess maybe it that's is, the yeah. lesson here. Some, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Sometimes it's very helpful having new names to describe things. Sometimes it's exclusionary. Sometimes yeah. it's it's unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. One project I noticed that still uses the word NFT is your current project, Untitled Frontier. And would love to hear a little bit about the transition kind of away from Mujo Music and then the birth of Untitled Frontier and what it is exactly. Yeah. As I mentioned before, like I'm a creator at heart. Like I've made music made games, made websites, uh, wrote novels. I know I enjoy creating things. And I kept trying to figure out, like, how do I focus on this? On this, Like, how do I combine this into something that makes sense? Because I got, like, frustrated with myself and not knowing what I should be focusing on. Because I find these things, all these different facets of creating and creation so interesting. And I realized there's like a thread that ran through all of the stuff that I enjoy and it's actually storytelling. Mm. So when you're making a startup, right, you have to tell a story about why this matters. When you're standing on stage and you're doing a talk, you're telling a story. If you're playing music, you're telling a story, you're trying to share something about how you feel about the world. If it's just, I want to make people feel happy or like I am sharing vulnerable things. Uh, If you're making a game, you have to tell a compelling story. If you're writing a blog post, you have to make sure that people understand the context of the post before they get into the meat of this, the, the article. So the through thread really was mm-hmm. storytelling. And so I was like, I want to continue figuring that out. Storytelling is my main focus. And it was for four years, a consensus. And then I left in 20, uh, early 2019. And then I was like, okay, let me take a bit of a break, figure out what I want to do next. And so for... Next six months, I was just like trying to take a break. And then somewhere in 2018, I had this idea for a book that I wanted to write and it never went away. And so June, 2019, I was like, okay, actually, I'm going to start. I'm actually going to write this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to write the novel, self-publish, get this out the door. And it took me a year and a half. um, Luckily, part of that was during the pandemic. So I could actually just focus on Mm -hmm. finishing it. 
I really enjoyed the process. It was, it, I just really enjoyed battling with this story for a year and a half. And it actually reminded me a lot of the stuff I was doing, token engineering, token economics and stuff like that, which is just like, you're constantly juggling with di different incentives from people, characters, the world they're in and so forth. Mm. And from there, I was like, I want to continue doing this. This is great. I want to continue building stories, writing stories. And the great thing about that was like, I could incorporate all my other passions through this, right? So with Antara Frontier, it's like, we're currently just doing a simple premise producing short science fiction and then selling NFTs as a merchandising relationship with the media. It's like, go watch Star Wars, go buy the lightsaber, come read mm -hmm. our short fiction, buy the digital quote unquote lightsaber, right? Mm -hmm. Story and learning production process, learning the, how everything works, learning storytelling, becoming a better editor, producer, showrunner, all the kind of skills that I need to improve. But with Untitled Frontier, I can still do, I still make music. I produce the audio nar narrations. I do like very light, like scoring on the audio dramas. I can you know, play with music there. Like I do writing and then I create the art for the NFTs and it's coding. So I can, I get to code again. So it's just all this mixed bag of stuff that I enjoy that I can merge. And I often tell people that Antara Frontier is like a Venn diagram of a publishing media house, an art studio, and a tech startup. So I'll just merge those three things together and <laughs> playing with it in different formats and yeah, learning, learning as much as I can while still just telling stories. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. So how, how exactly are NFTs involved? What's the importance of channeling through this project, the blockchain? Yeah. Like I mentioned, the, it's like a merchandising relationship. So I wanted to try, I didn't quite know how to 100% do it. So I, for each short story that's been published, I've tried to mimic essentially how traditional merchandise works. When something is released in at cinema, you can probably go to a store and go buy like the t-shirt or like the figurine or whatever. So there would be this period where the product is available. So what we did was we created sort of memorabilia from the stories as generative art. So Anyone that's also unique to blockchains that like you can do this variation, right? It does, it, in traditional merchandising, everyone has to buy the same figurine or the same t-shirt, but here right, you right. can use generative art to create the similar thematic product with unique variations. So everyone feels like they're getting unique variation when they buy. So for a four week campaign, while the story is, has been launched, uh, people can buy an nft and it was this was like before open editions were like super popular as like a distribution format for nfts we did like generative open editions so we started this stuff in 2021 and people could come pay like 20 to 30 dollars for an nft which to me was the product range of like merchandise right you that's what you would pay if you enjoyed something maybe right. 20 to 30 bucks now it's kind of difficult because the market has become less hype uh, and the blockchains also become more expensive, which mm -hmm. means that twenty thirty dollars is, is it's being priced out. I have to actually consider moving the stuff to layer two stuff. But again, that this that comes back to that problem of the product right, infrastructure right. and dilemma. Uh, but now it's becoming serious enough that it's okay. Like you can't expect someone to buy something worth thirty bucks and they're paying a thirty bucks transaction fee. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. So that that's the current format, the primary format. I've done some other experiments and some other short story formats and stuff, but that's that's been the primary format. Um, mm. And the goal has been to write six stories in this format, and story five is close to being done, and then story six will be the final one in that format. But there was like a commitment to try it out. But I think after that one, I'll probably try to do things a bit differently, experiment differently. I think there were a lot of lessons with this format. Can you speak briefly to what those big lessons were and how you were thinking of reformatting moving forward after this next story? Yeah, I think part of the goal with this, these kind of projects is I want, I'm still interested in making things that allow more creators to earn a living, right? So when you think about short, look at say short science fiction, right? So in short science fiction, most people who write short science fiction actually don't, they don't expect to make a living from it. Their right. goal really is just to this uh, write cool short stories 
and maybe get published in a in short science fiction magazine. But that's still primarily an avenue for them to maybe get noticed, to eventually right. get like a bigger publishing contract to maybe write a novel. There's few people that then eventually maybe write, combine it into a compendium and then sell a compendium, compendium of short stories eventually as an example. But everyone that publishes regular short science fiction probably has something else going on in their life. Whether they're writing normal, they're a normal writer, making a living from being a writer somewhere, or this is a hobby for them. You expect to make maybe if you get published, you could probably expect to maybe three hundred bucks to max maybe two thousand dollars to sell your short story to a magazine. And that's a good outcome. <laughs> yeah. Making a living living from this. So the goal really was to say, can I produce something in a repeatable format that allows short fiction writers to earn more than that four hundred dollars they would have if they sold this to a magazine? Right. And yes, I would say yes, it has succeeded in that sense. Every story that we've published so far has earned the writers more than the $400 than they would have if they sold it to a magazine. But the problem here is that the business model is a 50-50 split between the NFT sales between the writer and the business. And it's gross revenue. So I'm not recouping money first and then paying the writer. It's just mm -hmm. like the writers get 50 of all revenue, I get 50 of the rest of the revenue. And because the business carries all the rest of the production, like I'm paying the voice narrators, like I'm doing all the coding work, the production time of such a short story from inception to, to like launch is three months of work, three to four months of work. And the business is not making enough money to cover the costs to do that. So. It's a question of like, where do you need to improve? Maybe this model only works if I first recoup costs and then give stuff to the writers. Maybe I need to improve distribution, marketing. Maybe I need to change why the NFTs work. Maybe there's more traditional merchandising and we can also do like sell t-shirts or caps or whatever. So these are all the questions I'm asking about how to do this. Uh, maybe there's a simpler strategy or don't spend three to four, four months on a story. Like you don't need to do like audio production and stuff like that. or Generative art coding for each project, like it would be simpler NFTs, more of a magazine style approach, because now it's a top down production, like show running studio like production, whereas it could be more like magazine where you focus on being a distributor. So that's why mm. it's like, maybe I should angle more to not being a studio, but more like a publisher. Mm. So that's the kind of questions that's stewing in my head. But I'm also like spending the time now actually. For the next few months, I'm actually just writing a new novel because I began, like I have this idea in my head and I'm like, uh, okay, great, let me focus on this. Different times, different experiments. Yeah, totally. No, I love that you've created this thing that, that provides you an outlet for all of this kind of cross section of all of these different things that you enjoy doing. Yeah. And I was thinking of a lot of, a lot of allusions to music and of course, in the issues that you have with direct payments and in and this constant search for trying to find new revenue streams in, as a musician it extends to writers, extends to basically anyone who creates anything these days. It feels like a theme of our conversation has been evolution and like resilience and a willingness to iterate and just keep going. And you've been doing it a lot longer than, than most people have. Thanks for all the work that you've done to elevate the foundation to somewhere that people can people who are listening to this, people out there can continue to build from? I always try to, like I said before, if I fail at something and it becomes a lesson for someone else, that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. So I always try to be, I try to open source or make public some of the processes. So when I wrote my novel, I wrote three long blog posts about all the decisions I made with the storytelling, why this story What's the issues I faced as a first time writer writing a novel? Mm. And then I published all three drafts. So if you like want to read how shit the book was, so you can <laughs> <laughs> originally. And with the NFT stuff that I'm doing now for Untitled Frontier, like I, if I've been trying to publish also how I coded the stuff. People can go read and see how I made the decisions around the art and how mm. the coding works. I try to share as much as I can to also. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's definitely appreciated. We can all stand on your shoulders. <laughs> cool, Simon. This has been really, it's been a really great conversation. I just have one more question for you before we go that I ask everybody at the end of these. You're going to a desert island and you get to bring three albums with you. What are they? <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I have three. I think I have three. Cool. That was quick. 
I trust my gut feeling was the first topic came to mind. You should, you should. Yeah. Okay, there's one, I think, FX Twins, like, selected ambient works. I love that. Record. That is one of my top albums ever. One Beck album. Mm. If you're trying to make me choose a Beck album, it's going to be very <laughs> difficult. Don't know which Beck album I would choose. Maybe one of his earlier stuff, maybe Odelay or something like that. Mm. And then probably White Lies. But again, if you're trying to make me choose a White Lies album, it's mm -hmm. very difficult. Probably Friends. Friends from White Lies. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's good that's choice. What I said. That's the immediate ones that came to mind. Maybe I'll yeah. regret those decisions. But that's, yeah, that's the point of the question. It, yeah. <laughs> it is fundamentally impossible, but yeah. but it's interesting to see what three first come to your gut and then come out. So I, th I think it was a good trip. <laughs> Sweet. Cool, Simon. Yeah, this has been really great. Thank you so much for being here. For people who are listening, who want to follow along with the work that you're doing, what's the best place for them to find you? You can go to untitledfrontier.studio or my name is quite unique. So if you just Google my name, you can find me on various socials. I'm Simon DLR at wherever everyone is at the moment. Blue Sky, Mastodon, <laughs> Farcaster, Twitter, <laughs> wherever. Yeah, Everywhere. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again for being here, Simon. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the work that you do and wishing you the best. Thank you very much. This is, uh, really fun conversation absolutely okay cool take care cheers all right that's it for this episode of big brother and the hodling company i'm your host mckeegan voice and you can keep up with me and all the latest web3 music trends on twitter at mckeegan that's m-a-c-e-a-g-o-n this show is a production of decentral media and you can visit us at decentral.io and remember only you can prevent and fend off big brother